You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And welcome to The Mountain Gardener. This is your host, the hostess with the most is Ken Lane. We're here every week talking about the landscapes of northern Arizona. And fall, it just keeps going and going and going going. It's great. I love fall. The leaves are starting to come down. So I thought I would cover a couple things that are important to watch as we transition into fall. So those leaves have hung. And what I found is my fall color isn't quite as good as years past, at least here in the central Highland area. So the the red maples are, are red. They're great, but they've, they've been intense red, just crazy red in the past. And they're red, they're orange. It's got to be that dry. We went from monsoon, 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 and then it's been dry. So it's got, I don't know what the difference is. Or maybe I just didn't fertilize, it got alkaline, maybe it's just my trees. But the color, the aspens have been spectacular. That's a good thing. So you're just seeing this pro- progression. One thing I notice in my neighborhood, at least in Prescott, is that the red euonymus, the burning bush, really is late this year. Usually it's two weeks earlier than this. So it's got to be that mild weather. Several things affect when plants turn their fall color. It's going to be temperature. It's going to be light daylight. It's going to be moisture, soil temperature. All these things have variables. The sequence, when there's wet to dry, the daytime temperature to nighttime temperatures, all those have variables as to when plants turn and then the intensity is going to be the the amount of red or the amount of yellow or gold or orange purple right now that's going to be a matter of fertilization so how much food does the plant have the healthier it is the brighter the colors it just shows off and then the number one thing alkalinity if the alkalinity reaches too high you know you've got acid to alkaline and if you've got a pool or a spa you're measuring that alkalinity or acidity in your top. You've got a, a, a test strip that goes from basically zero to 10. And so if the lower the number, the more acidic, the higher the number, more alkaline. If it goes up too high, which our water is generally alkaline by itself, uh, it can it can mute the colors some. So those are some variables I've noticed just over the years that have, that, that make a difference as to the, the how, how colorful your fall color is. If you don't if you don't have great fall color in your yard, be aware because if your if your fall foliage your 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 autumn trees your maples aspens ash your locusts if they don't have the color intensity you like, what that means is it's going to be an alkalinity and fertilization thing, and that will eventually affect your evergreens. They'll also continue to mute. They won't be as green or as blue, or and, and they'll start to turn more of a chlorotic or yellow color to it. So put it as a marker. Oh, I don't like my fall color as much. My evergreens will be the same way by January, 1st of February. And so that's the case. You want to add two things. Fertilize with all-purpose plant food. It's a 744 fertilizer. It has cottonseed meal which is very acidic. We actually put sulfur in that fertilizer, so it's it's acidic. And then also we've got a, a mild iron in that. But in addition, just to counteract that alkalinity, go ahead and add at the same time soil sulfur. Soil sulfur. Now, how do I explain this? Now we're really getting deep. This is like master's level chemistry of soil. But really, if you can sum it right down, You've got two choices in the fall. The rest of the country right now is preaching add lime to your gardens. Put lime on the gardens. Put lime on your trees and your shrubs and your flowers and your vegetables. Put lime, lime, lime everywhere. Lime makes things more alkaline. Most of the country deals with acidity problems. Their water is acid. The leaf molds that fall are acid, and they've got a lot of topsoil that or organics that create things that make more acid. So they're always trying to raise, ever trying to raise the pH to make it more alkaline. The only place in the country that doesn't struggle with that, we've got just the opposite. It's flipped here in the Southwest. 
There's a little bubble here over Arizona, parts of New Mexico, southern Utah, southern California. There's a little bubble over the southwest that's very, very alkaline. So if you were to put lime on your soil, like the rest of the country, like HGTV is telling you to do, like Fine Garden Magazine's teaching you to do, they're they're gonna you're gonna kill your soil. You'll make the problem even worse. What we do, we do the opposite. So we put soil sulfur on. That's the opposite of lime. So there's a direct polar opposite. So lime makes things uh, alkaline. Sulfur makes things uh, acidic. So it brings the color out. So in addition to your all-purpose plant food, you also want to add soil sulfur. And this isn't for everyone. If, if you've been up to date, and you've been keeping track of, and you've been, been trying to watch this, and, and your colors are really good, and you've got great color, fragrance out of your flowers, and the brightness of the colors out of your flowers, you're fine. But if you've noticed that your fall color isn't quite as bright as some other neighbors around you, that's going to be, that's the issue. You've got high pH and fertilization issues. Those two things will be a game changer for next year's fall color, at least. But really for the winter evergreens, it will keep them looking green. It will intensify the blues. It'll make them look healthy and young and vibrant, even on the coldest of day in January. That's just something to watch. As a gardener, I mean, I can drive through neighborhoods at 50 miles an hour. I wouldn't do that. But if you're, I could, I could buzz right through and, and I could spot the, the, the yards that are having issues just very quickly, just by the color of the evergreens and the fall color of your autumn trees. Just those, those are things to watch right now. Some things I'm dealing with. This year, I, I've been... Pack rats aren't as bad this year for me. They were bad in the spring, and I haven't really had an issue. The voles, or field mice, that's vole is, is basically garden mouse. Same thing, a little bit more pointed nose, but basically it's a mouse. They're everywhere. They're taking over. Be aware. Kind of put that one on your radar as well. At least in northern Arizona, there's a chill in the air. They're predicting it's going to get cold. They're starting to look for colder or are getting out of the cold and more warmer spots. They're nesting. And here's where I find they're active in my own gardens. Up against the garden walls, behind the containers. Where the furniture pads are, they love those. In the hot tub or spa areas, they love the warmth coming off. They'll try to burrow through and eat a hole into the insulation. The rats will be active in that built-in grill. And the RV that you, you might be storing in, out in the field or out in the garage or out in the... Watch those areas because the rodents are starting to move where it's warmer. In my garage, underneath the workbench. So I have caught... I killed two voles, V-O-L-E, voles this, this in the back gardens. They were trying to get into the furniture pads. Two of them. This this week. Where did they come from? I've, I've had nothing, have nothing. Now all of a sudden they're they're hitting all my uh, traps. I've just got very sensitive rat traps because I mainly have pack rats. I've got a lot of chaparral and 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 uh, junipers and manzanita in my area, so that's where they tend to they like to live. And so I've been I mainly that's my nemesis. But the voles have all of a sudden become active. They're they're hitting my traps, so I've killed two. Uh, in the front yard, I just bait them. I go, ah, oh, that's enough. I'm just, that's where the dogs, I don't have to worry about them as much. In the backyard, I've got, I'm really sensitive to my, to my pets and you should too. So I never use poison in the backyard. Only, only the sticky traps, a little peanut butter, butter, or, or, a, or a, a snap trap with a little bit of peanut butter. It's irresistible to voles and rats. So I've had that. They've gotten in my office here at the garden center, voles. Did just thought of that. So I've got sticky traps out in the office to take care of them. So kind of watch that in your yard. Don't don't go inside just because eh, it's fall, the leaves are off. I'm done. Uh, go out and monitor every once in a while. Don't let them eat a hole in that hot tub. Don't let them strip the wires on your RV. Don't let them into the furniture pads or build a nest in your in your built-in grill. Maintain them. And then just a sticky trap. If you need help, come talk to me here at the garden center. I'll, I'll walk you right through what I'm doing. The staff knows. So we'll just walk you through that. But you should do a protective thing with that, either with re organic repellent, a snap tra trap to kind of kill them. Break, basically breaks their neck instantly, instantaneous, painless, painless death. 
guaranteed. Or Sticky Trap, that's brutal. Or Poisons out front. That, those are your choices right now in Northern Arizona. Be right back. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, also known as the Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain landscapes. In a new place, it's difficult to know who to trust, how to get help at the house, and which nursery will simply do what they say they'll do. At Waters Garden Center, we're here to help, in the landscape at least. Our team of plant ambassadors know your neighborhood, the plants that add color, increase privacy, and add fragrance and beauty. And we can show you exactly how to plant locally, or we have teams to do all the work for you. We are Ken and Lisa Lane, and we guarantee our plants will live up to every promise here at Waters Garden Center. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our McMinn Manzanita. Part of Waters' expanding native selection, this is the big, bold manzanita you find growing throughout Arizona. A local evergreen growing wild with the classic red bark for a style and drought-hardy landscape. Locally grown for local landscapes, this Easy Care shrub is just $39. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love lots of native plants, they love to shop. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now, welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. So we are back with my favorite gal, my travel buddy. It seems like we've traveled quite a bit. We had a 30-year anniversary together. In August, it seems like we've been out every other week so for long weekends. I don't so. feel like I've been home since August. Yeah. Kind of I mean, crazy. So it's been fun. I love traveling with my best friend, uh, marriage buddy, kid, <laughs> mother of my four kids, of our four kids. We just got back from El Paso. Yes, Those we did. Our grandkids. So our, our two grandsons, who are as cute as can be. Apples and oranges, they are so different. Yeah. That's amazing. That's exciting. We got some good news. Are we allowed to share that no. yet? Oh, no, we can't share that. Never mind. So we'll have that later. <laughs> <laughs> Two grandsons are fun, though. I love they it. Are. It's a grandfather. One, Both of them are like Garden Guy Jr. and, and uh, WWF uh, uh, yeah. Garden Guy. So Joshua, the three year old, you two are like two peas in a pod. I love that guy. <laughs> <laughs> he does have a personality. Oh, yeah. It's. Uh, Uniquely, he uh, he lives for the moment. He gets really excited. He gets really upset. I mean, everything's extreme. Uh, but what a funny kid! He are, just, are you saying that I'm also a guy of extreme? Uh, what are you saying? You said he's just like me. What is that? What do you what do you well, what are you saying over the you airwaves? <laughs> live your emotions. We'll put it that way. I enjoy life, and so does Josh. I'm the first guy on the dance floor. I'm and the so guy you want to. Yo, it's true. <laughs> I'm the guy you want speaking at your wedding, having mm-hmm. to toast. I'm the guy you want at your funeral because i'll bring the crowd down it's just uh, i love words and poetry and art and yeah and i'm a small business I'm not owner knocking it. okay i'm just saying sure. you two are I thought you said i wasn't alike. a man no because my feelings what i said oh good okay typical man <laughs> good you just that's what i wanted to what hear you want to hear <laughs> anyway this <laughs> i do like traveling with my best friend <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so we've, we've got, uh, this segment's all about questions, Q and A, mm-hmm. just what are folks talking about out in the landscape, your neighbors, you can learn a lot by just listening in. And so that's what this was created for. What do you got for us? Well, our first question is from Dina in Prescott. She has a neighbor, a few houses down that has a beautiful, large tree, okay. uh, that is now kind of orange and red and has an oval leaf. And she wants to know. What is that tree? Oh, pr- more than likely, and you can maybe chime in, but I'm guessing Bradford pears or ornamental pears are starting to turn color right now. Mm-hmm. And they'll go into color. They're kind of the, one of the last trees to turn red or orange in the fall of the year. And they'll be the, like that through December, really. There's, mm-hmm. a, there's a month-long process where it just goes, and eventually it's done, and all you have is this beautiful very light gray, almost white, not like aspen white, but close, very distinctive bark. It's very, very unusual. And then it, in the spring, it's got a beautiful white uh, mm-hmm. flower, kind of like bridal white flower that's just stunning. Right. It's unique in that it's got the perfect shape. You know, the leaves are perfectly round, glossy, and then they turn this red color. 
but the shape of the tree is actually similar to the leaf. It's got this beautiful oval shape to it, and it's just stunning and very drought hardy. It's mm-hmm. v- it's very adaptive. There's a lot of them around the courthouse here in in Prescott. They're throughout the Verde. They're, they even float down into Anthem in some parts, a little extreme at the low end level for for the deserts of Phoenix, that, that kind of thing. But they're that tough. Mm-hmm. And to the higher elevations of even Flagstaff and Williams, they're very diverse for the mountains of Arizona. But ornamental pairs, they don't form a pair. They're just a, uh, they form a, a flower like a pear. They have the glossy leaf like a pear. They have the fall color of a pear, but they don't put pears. They're just f- to be pretty, and that's it. Except for this year. What? I've seen I've seen a few small fruits on the ornamental pears. I think this was a very unusual year because yeah, you normally do not see it. But not Same way with the, the purple leaf plum. Right. That, the real short tree, maybe mid-teens, beautiful vase shape to it, purple leaves. It has little tiny cherries on it. It's actually a pear, prunus. Uh, which actually cherries or prunus are related right. very much, but they're very edible. Super unusual to see actual plums on this purple leaf plum. You just don't see it. Very delicious. The grandkids like to eat them and yeah. go, ooh, it's and got a bird. tart yeah. skin, very sweet in center, mm-hmm. like, a, like a plum does. But it just, we didn't have the frost. We didn't right. have this. It was so mild last year, moist, rainy. And I think that's the reason you're seeing this little dime-sized fruit. Mm-hmm. The animals and the birds, the jays, will come in and eat all those in January or so. You'll never have to clean them up. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. real easy. No, it's easy. not a messy tree. Oh, no, at not all. at all. So what? So there's a lot of variety of ornamental pear. You see yeah. Chanticleer, Aristocrat, uh, Red Spire, Bradford. Is there that much difference between them all, or are they pretty similar? That's actually a good question. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> no, oh, really what it is, they all get the same height, kind of mid-20s, maybe 30 feet at most. They all go to the same height. What you're really dealing with is how wide will it get? The bark is all that light gray. The leaves are all the same. The fall color is all the same. The, flower, the spring of uh, flowers, all the same. It's the width. How wide will it get? So the Bradford pear is the widest. It goes 20 by 20, just perfectly round shaped tree. Uh, I think aristocrat is the narrowest. It's maybe 20 foot, 25 foot tall by 12 foot wide. So it's more pyramidal shape. Mm -hmm. And then your chanticleer Chanticleer be a little bit wider. It's just a width thing. I don't think a non-professional... Not going to tell. They couldn't tell the difference between any of them. I'm perfectly comfortable selling you an aristocrat if you're asking for a Bradford pear. Going, it's, they'll never know the difference. It's the same. Plant with confidence. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the old timers, the original one, your grandparents planted a Bradford pear. It's a little bit too large for some landscapes. These lots are becoming smaller and smaller. Mm-hmm. And so you want something that gets the same height but narrower doesn't take as much real estate up. Right. And that's why we're coming out with new varieties of ornamental pears mm-hmm. that are narrower. Okay, good. All right. I'm going to shoot you another fall question okay. since we're on that topic. Um, so Scott has a 15 year old maple in his yard. Um, and this year it didn't really color up. It yeah. just kind of went yellow, brown dropped as losing leaves, but his neighbors two houses down has a gorgeous, yeah. beautiful color. So what's the difference? We should, I should go into depth on that. But basically, it's, it's going to be a fertilization thing. So we went from real moist, monsoon, to dry. So it could be irrigation. So we've been dry for a month and a half so or so. Almost two months. It could yeah. be that it just got dry and it didn't turn color. So you, your irrigation might be a little off. Tune-up time. That's when Colch at Johnny's Tree Service, they'll come out and tune up your whole thing, get it all set, winterize. They're good at irrigation. Or more than likely, it's a fertilization thing, especially if you're new to the area, you bought a pre-owned home, hasn't been maintained for a while, and it just has been starving. Mm -hmm. The pH crept up too high, the fertilizer, you just need to put more fertilizer on. At this point, it's too late to change that. You want to fertilize now to set the stage for next spring's leaf growth, fertilize again in July when the monsoons hit. And again, next October, about Halloween, and you'll have fabulous fall color. But I'm predicting it's probably a combo thereof. pH crept up too high. You want to add some soil, sulfur to things. You want to fertilize with the all-purpose plant food. And just check your, check your watering. 
Oh yeah. Make always. sure it's okay. <laughs> but it's not dead. It's not. It's just stress. It's showing off. Mm-hmm. It's going. Hey, you know, I'm not happy. I'm feeling a little pale. Look at me. Look at me. If you don't, if you don't take care of me, I'm going to die. <laughs> and so it's just kind of you're you're reading that, which is good. Yeah. The gardener's out in the yard reading it. Okay. So that's what's going on. All right. I think we can sneak one more in. Sure. So Jean has horrible, in her words, horrible clay in her yard. <laughs> yeah, um, no It just doesn't really drain very well, but she really wanted to get some Arizona cypress in there. Would okay. you do that or just go with another type of you, tree? Yeah, sure. You can do Arizona. Our planting crew, so we've got a planting crew that is fully busy. They're fully engaged right now. And privacy screens is a big deal. What we do is we'll dig a little bit wider hole. We'll amend it very heavily with mulch, water's premium mulch. And then if it's really heavy clay, the jackhammer doesn't, you know, bounces off of it or just gets stuck in the mud, they will actually leave about two inches of root out of the ground to ensure that at least that portion of the root can breathe during the monsoon or wet patterns. That is a game changer in those the valley areas where it's really heavy, that 69 corridor going out past Prescott Valley to Dewey Humboldt, all the way out, very heavy clays. Those are your secrets. Come in, we can give you the insider tip on that, tell you how to really do it right if you're going to do it yourself. Otherwise, how about us do it for you? Be right back with more on The Mountain Gardeners with Ken and Lisa Lane. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. If new neighbors are encroaching on your privacy, we have just the solution. At Waters, we have an entire section of thick, bold plants dedicated to privacy. Fall is a time to plant a new privacy hedge, and we're here as advisors. Take a quick measurement and snap a picture before you come visit, and you'll quickly be living in privacy once again. Plus, our team of experts know how to plant to increase plant growth next spring. We'll show you how or do all the planting work for you. Waters Garden Center, we know privacy in your backyard. Autumn flowers are nice, but some are absolutely snaptastic. Waters Orange Flame Snapdragon has been grown exclusively for the Prescott area. And looks like the plant has orange flames licking the foliage. Snaptastic. Snapdragons are unnatural in mountain gardens, with autumn blooms that snap back into bloom again in spring. Just $7. You'll only find them at Waters Garden Center in Prescott, where garden flowers are snaptastically fun to play with. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Mountain gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and garden advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. At the start of the show, I'd mentioned fall colors, of, of keeping your evergreens green and how to how to kind of juice them so that they stay healthy and vibrant and green to they they have better brighter colors they'll come out next spring with br- more flowers and more leaves but also one thing to watch I'm noticing that my autumn flowers are growing like crazy they're blooming like crazy right now so pansies johnny jump ups violas uh, hookahs, snapdragons, dusty miller. There's a whole series of flowers that love to bloom right through winter. Here, here, in, at least below the six thousand foot level. Yeah, okay, if you're up in the Flag Williams area, higher elevate the ridge lines of of the White Mountains. Okay, there it may go till the end of the year. And then they'll kind of permafrost will get to them and they'll kind of freeze in place. They might come back next spring. But the next layer down, this central highlands, chaparral areas, uh, the, the here, we're so mild, they keep blooming right through winter. And you can push a lot of new flowers on your, on your autumn or cool season flowers. I would say vegetables, my broccoli, same way. It's going crazy. Lettuce, crazy right now. It loves this temperature, this is the time when you want to add some of those. But what I'm trying to do myself, you know, my, my name's Ken. We're just neighbors talking over the fence and uh, friends. And we're just, to, here's what I'm doing in my own gardens to really make a difference. And that's the goal. We want you to be more successful. Your green, your thumbs to be greener. Your, uh, your, your containers more colorful. Your raised beds just show pieces right through winter. Here's what I'm doing. 
Of course, I planted those several weeks ago. It's not too late. You can still put those in and have tremendous success, especially in your containers and your raised beds. That's where I've really focused. I'm more focused. I'm not planting the entire landscape, but as the leaves drop, the landscape becomes more and more naked. And then that first frost comes and it obliterates all your begonias and geraniums and, and petunias and zinnias. And then you're just left with nothing. It's kind of depressing. It's, it really is just discouraging. So I know this is going to affect the gardener within me. And so I'm strategically trying to place some color that I can look at and go, oh, I've got hope. Look, pansies are so pretty. Oh, look, the snapdragons. There's a hummingbird. Look at that. Oh, it, it just why I want some, some inspiration in, in defined areas in my gardens, out by the front door, out of bay window on a deck or on a back patio by the hot tub. That's where I want some, some inspiration. So I'm, I'm focused on those. What I'm doing is I'm seeing some new growth. And I've been juicing my flowers to really get them while they're in this growth cycle. They love bright days and cool nights. They love this. I've been fertilizing with my flower power water-soluble fertilizer. So I've made a water-soluble fertilizer for northern Arizona. It's kind of unique. Uh, it's got a different formula. It's not salt-based like the miracle Grow products or some of these Scott's products. These, that, those are terrible products. If you've got those in your garage, never buy them again. I'm chastising you right now. Don't stay away from that garbage in northern Arizona. It does detriment to your to your guards, your flowers. It just all the salt base. Our water has so much mineral in it already. You're just adding to the problems. Flower Power, I made a fertilizer. It's a 105410. It's called Flower Power 54. That middle number creates flowers. And your fall colored vegetables and flowers just respond so well to that. They just take off. They'll set so many new flowers. So I've literally doubled in size in the last couple of weeks by giving them Flower Power. Every I'll do that every couple of weeks and, until I get a hard, hard freeze. Then I'll stop for the winter. And then whatever flowers I have, they kind of stay in place there. But you too can, can juice your flowers. You can really inspire them to grow, to bloom, to set new flowers by giving them this quick release flower food called Flower Power 54. It's here at the Garden Center. It's unique. It's not everywhere. You're not, you're not going to find it at Costco or Lowe's or any of these other humongous places. I'm just a little guy. I'm making this in the back. I mean, it's a little, it's just little. And so it looks kind of cheesy, but it's made for us. Just a plain white label container. Just It's just local. It's, it's for us. But it's a game changer. If you're in northern Arizona, game changer for how it brings out the flower and the fragrance of your pansies, your snapdragons, your dusty millers, your spinach, your lettuce, your, your broccoli, your hookahs. It really makes a difference on those. So, so get, encourage them. you got another month of growing where it's, you can just really juice these flowers so they're inspirational. Your friends are going to come over at Thanksgiving and Christmas going, whoa, you've got green thumbs. I know. I was listening to Ken on the Mountain Gardener radio show here. On the, I, he told me to put this stuff on. And it was a game changer. And it is. So that's some, something to watch. Now, I had mentioned earlier on the first segment of the show, uh, fertilizing your trees and your, your fall-colored stuff with all-purpose plant food and sulfur, I would say it's better to, on your containers and your flowery kind of things, the flower power is better than the all-purpose food. One's a liquid, quickly released, available to the plant right now. One is a slower release, longer term or permanent, go right through winter, all winter long fertilizing kind of food. That's the all-purpose food. The flower power is better for flowers. The all-purpose is better for general landscape, trees, and shrubs. I kind of help you. Again, if you get in trouble, come talk to me. I'll, I'll walk you right through. Oh, the staff is highly trained on how to create nutri nutritional value for your plants, and getting them to do, kind of be inspiring to the landscape. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Autumn grass is nice, but some are plume-tastic. 
Waters Regal Mist Grass is over-the-top plumetastic. You can count on this local native to plume without care for years. These new arrivals are covered in knee-high pink plumes that withstand the feistiest of wind. At just $14, you can afford to use them as decorations with pumpkins and gourds at the front door. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where decorative grasses are absolutely plumetastic. New to the area with your dream home on the inside, but surrounded by boring? A castle surrounded by rock is just so bland, but we can help. At Waters, we have a team of plant experts ready to dress up and decorate even the most boring of landscapes with something fresh, new, and evergreen. Plus, we deliver and plant for you. Designer plants with the experts to help you beautify your new abode. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. And back in the studio, Lisa Waters Lane. And this segment is the Garden Inspiration segment. Just how do we get some more creativity, some fragrance, some beauty, some color out in the yard? And so Lisa's got that that flair, that design idea that her yard is just gorgeous. I mean, people came Halloweening a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> and they're all commenting on uh, how pretty the yard pretty was. The yard and it was pretty, yeah. pretty nice, and that's your doing. Nice. It's, you know, it's amazing what a few flowers can do for a yard, a front yard, or entryway into a house. And I think, I think this is my big beef. People get home, they pull into the garage, and that's it. <laughs> you know, they never look at the front of their house. I think I've said that a hundred times. But a little bit of color makes a huge difference. It adds to the community, uh, neighborhood feel. Uh, I know in our neighborhood, people walk. We have tons of walkers yeah, in our neighborhood. True. So, and I love looking at people's yards, but there's some yards where you just, it's like, oh my goodness, just a little color, a little bit. You know, <laughs> I think be what you mentioned was it creates community. Mm -hmm. I think, I think landscapes get people out. They, they look at it. And when I'm out there putzing around, you bump into folks, you know, oh, you yeah. talk to neighbors, you're outside. When people are walking by, they're admiring, they're looking at it. It does create this bond. Mm -hmm. And it can't, it's got to be more than just rock lawn up to your front door <laughs> and a new house, Adobe house, right. painted beige. It's got to <laughs> be more than, oh, and in the backyard, it's even better. I've got stucco, not even stucco, just block walls <laughs> in the backyard. That's community. That's privacy. I, I think plants go a long way to soften that and connect people. Plants connect people. I never thought about that, mm -hmm. but you're right. It does add beauty and fragrance, and but also community. That that's good. Oh, yeah. Is yeah, that what definitely. you're talking about today? No, but oh. <laughs> it made me think of it with the yeah. the, the, the trick or treaters coming around. Yeah, true. And they were so cute and so nice this <laughs> no, year. They were nice. It's kind of nice. Everybody was so polite. Um, the little kids on up to the high schoolers, which I don't mind. High schoolers yeah. coming to my door. I think they're kind of a hoot. But, you know, <laughs> <That's true. laughs> and, and they were all so nice. And, and you're right. A lot of them commented on, oh, your yard is so pretty. And I think just having some color out there is such a difference uh, for people. They really recognize it. Yeah, I think it's nice. We live up above the high school in the Eagle Ridge at Prescott Lakes at the center of town in between the high school and the mall area. It's like a teenage family universe. Uh, we, we moved there because our kids, four kids, mm -hmm. was in the center of family universe. And then the kids all grew up. Uh, spouses died off. Families yeah. got old. Uh, it's the divorce. Just it came down to just widows and older, <laughs> empty nester folks. It's nice to see families it moving is. back into the neighborhoods. I think yeah. that's why it's you're seeing more kids. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice, more nice families, mm -hmm. which is great. I just so encourage. Just I think that's part of what Prescott's all about. Northern Arizona. Yeah. is about even in the roughest neighborhoods it's just family it's still even a even a rough prescott neighborhood is it's still not nice rough. it's not that <laughs> rough it's i feel i'd walk straight down and be perfectly oh, yeah. comfortable yeah <laughs> so, definitely i don't know but okay yeah, community is important we it need is. to we need to work more on that you know you look at the world and the things that happen and it's kind of been a tragic week last week yeah, with the yeah. church shootings and things. And you just go, oh, it just makes you want to go live in a cave. But that's probably the opposite of what you need to do. You need to be out in your community more and know your neighbors and yeah. uh, the people around you and be involved. I mean, I think that's something. Can I just get on my Waters oh, no. family okay. so soapbox? 
we stand for that. I mean, our family business, we don't just, we don't sell plants. We're not in the plant business. We're in the community, neighborhood, church, service club, neighbor, connecting with a neighbor. Uh, we're in that business. We create neighborhoods and we're purposeful with that. So we have huge fundraisers that support the arts that support uh, math and reading clinics for, for kids that are struggling. We, we have certain things that we stand for. Mm -hmm. That's more than just our church that we give to Yeah, We tithe there too, but it's, this is a business, a small business has, I think a responsibility to their community to build that. I don't think box stores do that. I think, yeah, they'll give you a bicycle and they'll suck millions out of the community and they'll give back a couple coins. They'll chuck them out there at you. And yeah, yeah, we feel supported, but for the amount that they take to the, what they give back is disproportionate. Whereas smaller businesses, we give it almost just as much or more. I mean, we gave mm -hmm. back $72,000 last year in just stuff and raising monies and supporting groups because we're trying desperately to support those nonprofits. I'll be at Big Brothers and Big Sisters next weekend. They're big gala thing, helping them out, give you my, my personality to it to help build community, mm -hmm. to bring people together. I think that's what small, we're a boutique garden center you can't find anywhere else. And I think you could say that about Plant Fair and Payson, about Warners and Flagstaff, about Violas. You can say that about your 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 small, small companies. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not many of us left, but we're building <laughs> more connections. Yeah. I oh, think I it's agree. because our kids play soccer with your kids. We sit in oh, this yeah. church pew with your kids. We're, we're, we're neighbors. We're living in the community. I think that makes a difference. I think we can, we need to focus more on that. We've, we've let that go. I think. Uh, am Seems I wrong that on that? No, I, I, I think, I think you're right. I think, um, people, even with the advent of Facebook and uh, all the social medias, the ways to connect, people seem more disconnected than ever. So yeah. being involved in community, small businesses, uh, events that go on. Prescott's a very active. Um, there's lots of different things from the arts to you name it. Outdoor That's enthusiasts. That's true. We are, we are a mean, donation of time and money kind of place. Yeah. That's true. There's so many things to get involved in and be out in the community in, and you need to take advantage of that. Yeah. If you're new to the area, don't be afraid. There's very few Prescottonians, and I am not one. My parents retired <laughs> here when I was a teenager, and then I just grew up and went to mid high and high school and college, and that's so it seems like I'm a local, but I'm not. You're a local. I'm you were local. born here. Uh, you're you're like a fraction of one percent left anymore. We're all from <laughs> other places. Jump in, and but I think we need to jump in and look to make a difference. Right. Whatever your passion is, if yours is about pets, or yours is about farmers markets, or about symphonies, or about service clubs or churches or whatever it is, jump in mm -hmm. and make a difference. I think that makes community. Oh, I agree. So we, we're on to a talk show opinion piece all the time. I know, we totally miss that. <laughs> but we're small business. We live for this. We're actually right. trying to make a purposeful difference. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I really don't want to take any wealth with me. I don't want to give it all to the kids. I'll make sure you got an education and a house that's paid for and a car. But then that, after that, it's all going back to the community and making right. a difference. And mm -hmm. that's, that's our passion. So right. that, that's in the interim. Let's see if we can make a difference right now in, in the community. So you want to give one bit of garden advice before we, <laughs> before we go on? Or we could take the last <laughs> two minutes and keep, keep going on and on and on. <laughs> well, I was going to talk about deer and rabbits in the yard. They're because bad. Because they're, um, they're back in full force they now. Are. We've had some dry weather, almost two months without rain. Um, and so they're looking for moisture and they get that out of the plants sometimes. So we've had a lot of people in, uh, with deer and rabbit issues, just munching down on everything. Yeah. So, um, you know, and one of the other things that the deer do, people who have aspen and birch, you yeah. know, they're rubbing their antlers and chewing on bark. Um, so just those kind of issues is going to cover, um, but you can come down and talk to us at the store. You know what you should do? Why don't you print out some extra copies of our plant, our deer and rabbit mm -hmm. resistive plant list? Right. We'll just have them. Let, let Patty and the crew know at the register. Yeah. If you come in, just hey, I heard Lisa on the radio. There, is there a deer and rabbit list? We'll have mm -hmm. a. So there's some plants that animals just don't like. Oh yeah. And and pretty much they read the list. Not everyone, <laughs> but that's a place to start. We can hone yeah. you in if they're rubbing bark. 
We could show you how to keep how keep to them from rubbing. Them. Yeah, we yeah, can do all bet. that. So. There are certain plants, or there are certain ways or techniques you can use. Tips and tricks. Yeah, tips and tricks. <laughs> I think part of this, the hunt season is on, and so oh, the deer yeah. are being compressed in the neighborhoods where there's no where you can't hunt. That's true. I think that's part of it. Part of it's moisture. Mm-hmm. The things that they were eating is now dried up. They're coming into where you've got you've planted for them. It's like a buffet. Right. It's like Vegas, unlimited buffet. Let's eat it. <laughs> I think it's part. I think it's multifaceted. Come, we can help you out. Come talk to Lisa and the crew here at Waters Garden Center. Be right back. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Ouch! Oh man, another rock! Hi, I'm Rusty. You know, the shovel you're destroying trying to dig that hole? Sure, I get it. You got these beautiful plants at Waters Garden Center. Waters asked if they could plant them for you, but no. You had to do it yourself, even though they would plant, deliver, and guarantee your plants for two years. I hope I don't end up like that old pickaxe. Ouch! Prevent yard tool abuse. Waters Garden Center. They plant, deliver, and guarantee. Let us cover as the leaves drop, and we'll progress for another, well, by the first part of December or so. It's a long autumn that we have in, in northern Arizona. So enjoy. Enjoy the feng shui. I know this is difficult, so hard for you nurses, the accountants, the the, the numbers people. You just so are so perfect. You want everything shaped. You computer engineer folks, you, you like it exactly clean, sterile, organized, shaped. But that's not fall. Fall is more about going with the flow and watching the wind swirl things around and leaves drop and just enjoying the pattern that shows up on the rock lawn and how it gathers in corners and then then go through and and and, and clean things up. So don't don't be too much of a hurry. You're okay to leave those leaves out there for a bit, but eventually they're all going to drop and it's going to be pretty naked out there. I mean, it's going to be bare. It'll look like winter. This is when your evergreens really become the showpiece. They take center stage through winter. And so 20%, I'd say at least 20 to 25% of your landscape should be given to evergreens. If you don't have enough evergreens, it'll look bare. Just go, oh, just what happened? Nothing's here. So that's a general landscape pattern. If I'm helping you design a garden bed or a front landscape, I'll, I'll dedicate about 20% to just evergreens, spruce and pine and fir and shrubs. So I wanted to cover some of the shrubs that really shine in northern Arizona. This is all elevations. They're just showstoppers this time of year right through, I would say, March. And then March, eventually, the forsythia are in bloom. You have spring is here, uh, the first part of March, end of February, depending on your elevation. But these plants, so I, I broke it down into shade shrubs. Things that are in the harsher shade or that north, northeast, west, those areas underneath the trees. There's some evergreens that really do well there. I've got, got a list of those and some of the sunny things uh, that just love being out there exposed, surrounded by rock. These are things that just naturalize so well and just show off through winter. And so why don't I start with uh, shade or sun? Let's start with... Oh, and then I've got a list of natives. Okay, here, here we go. Let's start with shades. I'll be hard-pressed to get them all in. Hollies. You folks from the East and Midwest, you'll love this. Hollies do exceptionally well here in Northern Arizona, as long as it's in the shade. They don't take that direct sun very well. Uh, they'll take some sun, a lot of sun. But that midday sun during June, they're not going to like that. But more of the shade, the North, East, and West areas, that's their place. And a lot of hollies do well here. Not all of them. You were looking for a holly with a little bit smaller leaf and a thicker leaf and more waxy leaf. Those are going to be your royal court hollies. This is where they've blended the girl and boy, male and female holly on the same bush. So all you need is one plant and it will bloom and bury at the same time on the same plant. This is genius. Uh, you've got blue girl, blue boy. If you're from, from the East Coast, older. Uh, plants, those you need to plant together so they'd cross-pollinate. They've taken that out. They've got a plant that'll do it for you, Royal Court Holly. Kind of a nice little hip-high by hip-wide. Emerald Colonnade Holly gets very tall. 
10 feet tall by a foot wide. Colonnade, in other words. A grin. Great holly. Those are probably about 30, 40 bucks for a nice big one if you're looking at it. So, so affordable. I personally use Hicks U. I've got a big sterile wall. Just two-story stucco, nothing, not even a window in this wall going up to the, to, from the basement up to the garage. It needed something. So I used Hicks U. They're now standing, my personal ones are now stand, standing 12 feet tall by uh, two, three feet wide. Spectacular. They're on the north side. They're stunning. They have red berries on them, thick evergreen. Animals don't eat it. Javelina, deer, whatever. Rabbits, they don't bother you. So that's a good, good choice. They also make, let's see, I had, I was looking at those. They're running about 44 bucks. And for, for a tall one, I mean a big one, and then they've got little one, you know, gallon size stuff too. So there's cheaper ones. And then also there's a spreading you. If you've got underneath the tree or down a hillside that's the north side, you need something that spreads out. They make a spreading you. It does the same thing. Um, oh, honey made holly. They have a gold variegated holly. I've got two out there. Uh, gold is rather unusual, but in a dark spot, it can look quite nice by the front door in a container. Uh, looks really good. I've got honey made holly. So it has honey colored tips, foliage on it. These are really chubby, fat, just good looking uh, holly. Big five gallons for about 49 bucks. And then I've got variegated gold hollies that look like a Christmas tree. They're standing head high. They look like a tree. I mean, instantaneous. I put these by the, by the back patio, uh, the, the deck, the front door where it's more shaded. They're going to run about 120 bucks, but they're huge. They're, they're like instant holiday decor. Put some lights on them, put some little bows, and you're going to leave them right outdoors to greet people as they come and go, and it will, it will thrive right through our cold. Even if you didn't plant it, it's in a five-gallon bucket. I say that variegated tree-like uh, a holly. You didn't even plant it. If you kept it watered every few days in its original bucket right there by your front door, it would do just fine. It would go right through winter. It would live. It'll take that cold that's coming for it. But that, that's another one. Another one I really like and I've used in a number of my houses over the years, Ice Princess Camellia. You Californians, you're going to love this. You folks on that western coast, you're famous for your camellias. But most of them are, are tropical. They won't take our cold. This Ice Princess series, there's one variety and mine have gone sub-zero on me and done just fine. They bloom every spring. They're kind of the first thing to bloom. They even bloom before the forsythia does in, in March. So they'll be in bloom February through March, April, first part of May. An incredible bloom cycle. The flowers may be only six inches across instead of your traditional eight, nine, ten inches across, like a tropical camellia. But it's evergreen, blooms in the spring. It's good looking. The buds are huge on these right now. They come in red. Uh, they come in uh, pink and kind of an apple blossom. They're a little more expensive. I think that I was looking at them. A big bush is like 69 bucks, but they're fully loaded in flowers. And then Nandina or Heavenly Bamboo. This is a transition. It'll go sun or shade. Great choice. This is, it's an evergreen plant that animals don't eat again. Uh, rabbits, deer, heavily, they, they leave Nandina alone. I really like the Siena Sunrise. Nandina because it's very bright. It's got a almost like a a red. If it's in more sun, it'll turn red. If it's in the shade, it'll stay green. Some of your sun plants, you're noticing how pretty the rosemary is. Yes, an herb will grow right through winter in full sun in the northern Arizona. Does exceptionally well and fragrant. A good thing about uh, rosemary is it blooms in February and March. Right when the bees are starting, starting to warm up, the bees need something. They're hungry. They've been hibernating. They use your rosemary as a, a food source. A red tip photinia, number one uh, uh, seller out there. It gets huge, to 10 by 10, 12 by 12. Uh, I mean, if you plant them in the wrong place, your house will be blocked by everything, by this tree, but, but a great choice. Uh, wax leaf privet. It kind of looks like red tip photinia, only it's green without the red growth. Intense green. Exceptionally good green, evergreen for the mountains of Arizona. You know, what are those running? A nice looking one gallon was like 14 bucks. 
Boxwoods. So they stay knee high, a little smaller evergreen leaf, about 14 bucks. Silver King Euonymus. All the Euonymus does really well here. But the, some of them get really big, uh, like the Silver King. Uh, Manhattans get kind of a me medium size, has a, has a green leaf. Silver King has a gold or, or a silver leaf to it. A lot of varieties. Uh, you, some of them are, are creeping. They stay just ankle high or knee high and spread out. Lots of choices. Now, Euonymus, sometimes the, the animals can go after them, mainly bunnies, when they're younger. So you want to fence those in, protect them while they're young. And then once they get big enough, yeah, they're tough and thick and animals don't bother them. Some natives, silverberry is a native that grows wild here. Uh, some beautiful, beautiful silverberries for 36 bucks. Nice evergreen native. Just get, water it for a year and let it go on by itself. It's a great plant for here. Indian hawthorn, prickly pear. I just got some beautiful prickly pear in that are just stunning right now. Evergreen. Yeah, red yuccas, silver spoons, Arizona rosewood. That's one you'll, th you'll find wild out in the chaparral areas. Beautiful green leaf. You'd almost think it was a, a manzanita on steroids. It's so pretty. But it's, it's a good native plant for here. They were running, what is that, like 39 bucks. And the list goes on. This is a good time to shop your nurseries for evergreens because you can see what they actually look like as it gets colder. Be right back with more on The Mountain Gardener. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. I was raised in a nice house with my family. Now I'm out on my own and have my own apartment. I love my cute little place, but there's something I do miss. I miss my mom's garden in the backyard. It was so special because over the years I was growing up, I watched her give those flowers and plants such a personal, loving touch and so much color. I miss it so. Well, guess what? I just visited my local garden center and they gave me some great ideas. And now, because of them, when I look out my patio window, I see the beautiful planter they suggested, teeming with flowers, bright Arizona flowers. Looking at those flowers gives me such a nice feeling, and it's almost like being with mom in the backyard all over again. Want help with planting? It's all online at plant-something.org. Brought to you by the Arizona Nursery Association at plant-something.org. You'll love it, too. If new neighbors are encroaching on your privacy, we have just the solution. At Waters, we have an entire section of thick, bold plants dedicated to privacy. Fall is a time to plant a new privacy hedge, and we're here as advisors. Take a quick measurement and snap a picture before you come visit, and you'll quickly be living in privacy once again. Plus, our team of experts know how to plant to increase plant growth next spring. We'll show you how or do all the planting work for you. Waters Garden Center. We know privacy in your backyard. Okay, so we were talking evergreens. And one that I, it's not really a shrub. It's more of a tree, but it's a small tree that I want to highlight for you. Uh, there is a southern magnolia that will grow here. There's one hardy variety. It's, it stays smaller than your traditional southern magnolia, like you folks from the deep southeast. It's like that. The flower is the same size, great big eight-inch cross, fragrant as can be white flower. The leaves are traditional magnolia size, evergreen leaf. It gets up maybe maybe a foot long by four inches wide, something like that. But I've got two of these that, that accent a fountain in my front yard. I use it as a, as a backdrop or as a frame to bring the eye forward through this beautiful uh, polished granite fountain that bubbles up, the birds love. And so I'm using it as a, as a way to create more green, add some flowers during the, the summer and fall season, but then to show off this beautiful piece of art that the water's flowing through. That does actually grow here quite well. And we've got some, I think some five gallons out there. What were they running? Like 89 bucks for this beautiful, big, not big, head high tree magnolia. There's one variety. Do your homework on your magnolias because not very few of them grow here, but there are some that do exceptionally well. And I'm witness. I've got some beauties. Mine have grown. They're maybe oh, 10 feet tall now. 
They've been in for three or four years. They grow about a foot a year. They're just, but you can count on them to bloom every every summer. They're going to bloom. It's green all the time. It's a great plant for northern, northern Arizona. Let me just translate or, or move on to perennials. I'm having a lot of customers come into the garden center. Want to know, when do I cut back my perennials? Now, perennials are those flowers that come back every year. So it can be anything from Russian sage all the way down to autumn sage or salvia gregii down to gallardias and and, uh, black-eyed Susans and everything in between. Generally, here's what we do. We don't do a lot like you do in the Midwest. You cut them back, you insulate them, you put leaves over, you put cages around them. We don't do any of that. We just don't get cold. Like the Midwest, we don't we don't have those issues. So here, what we do is we don't cut them back. We leave them intact. We leave that foliage on top of the plant, even though it's brown or gold, or we just enjoy that color. Snow will load up on them; they'll kind of protect them. But if we leave that structure intact above that root structure, it insulates by itself, protects that root. So if we do have a really harsh winter. It'll protect that plant and, and really make it healthier, keep it healthier through winter, and it'll come out. We generally will prune our perennials after the new year, and I personally wait till after Valentine's Day. So that mid-February, I'll start tr- trimming things back. And by then, you'll see your chrysanthemums, your asters. They're starting to grow. You're seeing green mounds coming up. But if you had just left them, if you cut them back now, left them exposed, you might not see that, or it might actually nip the crown or the top of that root back and it take longer for them to come out in spring. The same with your roses. Don't prune roses back yet. Keep them intact and then prune them back usually end of February through March. Really the rosarians, say March. That's kind of the insider's tip on, on when to prune back perennials. Your roses, rosemaries, kind of wait. Don't be in a hurry. Uh, well, just enjoy the season for what it is. Throughout the week, Lisa and I camp out here at Waters Garden Center. Hope to help you any way we can in the gardens. The Mountain Gardener, your source for garden advice right for the higher elevation of Arizona with local garden expert and the Mountain Gardener himself, Ken Lane. Listen in every week for Ken's tips, tricks, and techniques that are guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. In a new place, it's difficult to know who to trust, how to get help at the house, and which nursery will simply do what they say they'll do. At Waters Garden Center, we're here to help, in the landscape at least. Our team of plant ambassadors know your neighborhood, the plants that add color, increase privacy, and add fragrance and beauty. And we can show you exactly how to plant locally, or we have teams to do all the work for you. We are Ken and Lisa Lane, and we guarantee our plants will live up to every promise here at Waters Garden Center. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our McMinn Manzanita. Part of Waters' expanding native selection, this is the big, bold manzanita you find growing throughout Arizona. A local evergreen growing wild with the classic red bark for a style and drought-hardy landscape. Locally grown for local landscapes, this Easy Care shrub is just $39. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love lots of native plants, they love to shop. You've been listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to the area. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center located in Prescott at 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener.